Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 15, verse 11. Amen. And it reads, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? Amen. You may be seated. As we continue in our series of sermons, our series standing strong as we look at our world and the direction in which it is headed we need to be able to stand in hard times difficult times standing strong and our theme scripture is Romans 12 and 2 and we're going to read that together let's read that it's on the side wall over here if you could uh, read along with us. Let's read that together. Go ahead. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. You need a transformed mind. In other words, when you accept the Lord as your Savior, you are saved. You are now on your way to heaven, but there's a little problem. We don't know how to live saved. All we know is our old life. So we need a renewed mind. We need to get our minds right so that we can know what is good. We don't know good from bad. We don't know what is acceptable from what is unacceptable. So we have to study God's word and then we'll know his perfect will. And as we move on uh, in this second phase of a series of sermons, our subject uh, for three of the sermons will be the goodness of God. The goodness of God. If you want to write that in, the goodness of God. Somebody may not know that God is good. Uh, God is good, not by your standard of what good is, but we need to find out what God's goodness is because what we call good may not be good at all. Amen. So the goodness of God is where we're headed in three sermons. And on today, uh, we're going to focus just for a little while uh, as a theme, God's moral purity. God's moral purity. Uh, if the qualities of uh, greatness described uh, about God uh, and his attributes when we talk about God being good and God being great, we need to understand that he is all-powerful. And in study of the world, as they look at God's uh, some have looked at God's as even being immoral. Some have looked at God's as being amoral. But we want you to know that you serve a moral God. Tell your neighbor, my God is moral. My God is moral. We need to understand this about the God we serve. He's a moral God. And we're going to look at his moral qualities. Uh, and uh, the first one uh, we're going to look at on this morning is that God is holy. But before we do that, what is moral purity? What do we mean by moral purity? By moral purity, we are referring to God's absolute freedom from, freedom from anything wicked or evil. God is not affected uh, by any wickedness that happens anywhere in the universe or any evil. He's separate from, uh, and so that's why he can be moral. I understand that some of us, sometimes we are affected by our environment. Uh, we may have every intention on being a moral person. 
person. You ever woke up in the morning and say, I'm not going to do anything bad today. I'm not going to uh, think uh, evil or do, I, I'm, I'm going to have a good day. You ever woke up and said that? And then before you can get out the door, somebody have already worked on your nerves. Do I have a few minutes? Uh, to, to explain that to you, uh, you know, you said you wasn't going to use any of those French words you used to use before you were say, y'all know some of them French words I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah Reverend Carl said they fresh in his mind, French. Uh, but uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? You, you declared on that day, Reverend yeah. Carl, that I'm not going to speak French today. But before you can get out the door good, somebody's trying to get you to go back to your original language. Do I have a few minutes? So moral purity with God, however, he's separate from anything wicked or evil. That's how it's going to be when we go to heaven, my brothers and sisters. Uh, when we go to heaven, we won't have to worry about evil tempting us or bothering us we won't be tempted at all when we go to heaven can you imagine every day being a good day yeah. oh that's going to be something else uh, uh, so in, in keeping that in mind in our definition of understanding moral purity this is possible with God because firstly God is holy so we're going to look at God's holiness God is holy now when we use that word some of you think that means better than, okay? But no, uh, we're talking about separate from. Yeah. Separate from. Uh, when, when God tells you to be holy as he is holy, he's asking you to move over into his arena. Come on, come on over here where I am and uh, be in, uh, my, under my what, influence and, and come away from that other what, influence. Be ye holy as I am what holy amen so uh, let us study this a little bit uh, if we look at Exodus 15 and 11 uh, our text it says who among the gods is like you Lord who is like you uh, who is like you majestic in holiness or uh, awesome in glory and working wonders uh, so you see God is unique in that he's not like any other. There's no one like God. There's, you, know, you can't find uh, no one to be like God for he is totally separate from all of creation. Uh, I want you to know that everything you see and cannot see, God created it. And he's separate from his creation, uh, Louis Burkhoff called it the ma majesty holiness of God. The uniqueness of God is affirmed. Uh, Isaiah saw the Lord high and exalted sitting on a throne. Uh, look at this. God is holy. And I want you to understand the terminology. The Hebrew word for holy, uh, kodash, means marked off or withdrawn from common, ordinary use. Uh, my brothers and sisters, uh, when I was a young man, uh, my mother would tell me about young ladies and she would tell me, you stay away from common girls. And uh, she didn't know my vocabulary was very limited, so was my understanding. I didn't know what she was talking about. But as an older man, I understand. When you find young ladies who want to be loud, do I have a witness, and, and seen and sacrifice themselves to be noticed, uh, they call them common. Do I have a few witnesses in here? A lot of folk, or uh, even perhaps some in the church, want to be seen, and they would do just about anything to be seen, and they would make themselves common. Ask your neighbor, are you common? They're not going to tell you. Amen. Uh, but listen, uh, when you're holy, you're withdrawn from common. Uh, yes, we ought to look different from the world. We ought to be uh, unique and distinguished from the average person out there. And God is marked off. God is 
withdrawn from common. God is uh, different. He's not the ordinary. Uh, and Isaiah said, I saw him high and exalted sitting on a throne. Let's look at that scripture together. And when Isaiah realized he was in the presence of this holy, mocked off, separated God, he, he got pretty nervous. And he said, woe to me. I cried. I, I hear some of us, we say, Lord, come in my room, please. You don't want God no. to come in your room. You don't mean that because you're not fit for a holy God to be in your presence. So he says, woe to me, I cried. I am ruined for I am a man of what kind of lips? In other words, Isaiah said he must have spoke a little French at times. Amen. So he had unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Amen. And he was scared. He was nervous. And uh, not only did he re realize that, but later in the New Testament, when uh, Jesus told Peter uh, to, to throw his net on the other side of the boat, Peter said, well, look, we had been fishing all day. Lord, I know you a good spiritual man, and you, you know uh, the, the Bible pretty good, and, uh, but uh, we are fishermen, and we've been out here all day. But look, just to, uh, yeah, to uh, benefit you, I'll go ahead and throw it on the other side of the boat. And they caught more fish than they could handle. Do I have a witness? Tell your neighbor, if you trust God, he can bless you mightily. Yeah, he can bless you if you're obedient to his word. And when Peter did that, Peter realized that Jesus was not an ordinary man. And I want you to read with me his response. At verse 8, he says, it says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said what? Go away from me, Lord. I am a what? Sinful man. My brothers and sisters, when you sin, you ought to feel uncomfortable in the presence of the Lord. Do I have a witness? When you walk in here, I don't know about you, but I come in here quite often. And when I walk in here, one of the very first things I say is, Father, forgive me for my sins. Do I have a witness in here? Uh, just being in the presence of this place reminds me of the presence of the Lord. And when you're in the presence of God, you ought to realize there's a vast difference between you and God. Do I have a witness? Uh, Jesus is more than the man upstairs. Do I have a witness? How many of you understand he's God all by himself? Uh, and so we need to understand, first of all, that God is distinguished. He's holy. He's separate from. He's all by himself. And he should be respected as God. All right. We got that one. Let's move on then. Uh, not only is God holy, but we need to know that God is righteous. God is righteous. Uh, so we're going to look at God's righteousness. Uh, he is right. Uh, he does what is right. Do I have a witness in here? How many of us know we got doing wrong down pat? If the struggle is doing what is what? Right. How many of you struggle with doing what is right? Uh, and, and listen, you don't have to uh, go so deep into your life. Uh, you can start at the dinner table. How many of you know we don't even know when to stop eating? Uh -oh. so we, we don't know how to do right right there at the dinner table, right? Uh, some of us don't know how to do right when it comes to brushing our teeth. Some of y'all skip it. Ask the dentist if you skip it. Somebody say, Pastor, how you know? The dentist told me your business. Amen. Some of us don't know just basic things that are right. We have, right is difficult, Reverend Carl, for yeah. us. Uh, doing the right thing is hard, but doing wrong, we find that easy. Do I have a witness in here? But see, you need to understand God. God doesn't struggle in these areas because he is righteous. He's right 
all the time. Let's look at Psalms 19, 7 through 9. The law of the Lord, the written law of the Lord is what, church? It's perfect. It's perfect. When you pick up your Bible, you need to understand that you're reading the perfect law of God, refreshing to the soul. The statues of the Lord are trustworthy. You can take it to the bank. What God says, you can believe that. Making wise the simple. And let me talk to you a little bit. All of us, we're outside of God, are just simple-minded. Listen, don't think too much of yourself. Without God, you are simple-minded. Now, I can prove it to you. How many of you can look back over the years at some of your own conversation and say, what in the world was I saying? What in the world was I thinking, right? You know that without God, you can't think very well. I know we like to pretend and try to uh, help each other understand that we're all that and, and, and that I know what I'm talking about. But when you start reading God's word, you will find out that your past conversation was simple. Simple minded. Simple minded. And, but the word of God can make wise the simple. Yeah. Does everybody follow what I'm saying here? Look at verse 8. The precepts, the precepts are the teaching of the Lord are right. Giving joy to the heart. If you want to have a joyous life, listen at the teachings of God. Every time you have the opportunity to be taught God's word, you ought to come running. Raise your hand if you want to be happy. Raise your hand if you're happy is what you want. Well, that word blessed means happy. And if you want to be happy, you need the word of God, the teaching of God, and then you'll live a happy life. The commands of the Lord, look at that, are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Meaning open your understanding. You can understand and see life better when you have the word of God. Look at verse 9. It says, the fear of our respect of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are what, church? Righteous. They're righteous. So if you want to have a righteous life, if you want to learn how to do what is right, you need to get involved with the word of God. Take some notes. Note number one says, God commands only what is right. So God's commands are not burdensome as some of you may think they are. He's commanding what is right and what will therefore have a positive effect on the believer who obeys. Now, knowing what is right and doing what is right are two different things now. You, first, you do need to know what is right, but I be, it, it behooves you to do what is right as well. So when you learn something, you ought to do it. Somebody say, when you know better, you ought to. Come on, there it is. So don't just come here and learn and go back and repeat the same old behavior because the God's command only what is right for us. Note number two, write this down. The righteousness of God also means that his actions are in accord with the laws he himself has established. The righteousness of God, the righteousness, write that down, of God also means that his actions, whatever God does, it, it, it works in accord with the law. God does not do the opposite of what he's already said. In other words, when you study the Bible, you can put money on that God's going to do that very thing. So he works right with his law. And there's a reason for that. All right. Now, Genesis 18, 25, uh, Abraham said this. He said, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? So you need to understand that God in his action, everything that he does 
is the right thing. Yeah. It may not seem like the right thing to us, you know, especially when we lose a loved one. That seems like a terrible thing, but God never does anything that is wrong. He always does what is right. Do I have a witness in here? And my brothers and sisters, we need to learn from God how to do what is right. We've got to learn to do the right thing. Some of us are so caught up and so bent on doing the wrong thing. You've got so accustomed to doing the wrong thing that now you think what is wrong is right, my brothers and sisters. But you need to learn the truth of God's word and, and then learn how. Get accustomed. Start practicing how to do the right thing. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, do the right thing. You got to learn to do what is right. My brothers and sisters, I don't care how long you've been doing the wrong thing. It's time for you to start doing the right thing. Yeah. If you are a believer of Christ, if you have accepted him as your savior, uh, my brothers and sisters, you need to understand that he's also your Lord. Lord means he's your master. He's your ruler. And you need to learn to obey him and do what is right. Now, some of this rightness is uncomfortable for you yeah. when he tells you to love your enemies that that's a hard right thing to do uh, to love somebody who hates you is difficult for you but you've got to learn to love them anyway when he says turn the other cheek that means get out of this violent attitude that uh, I'm going to get you. If you do something to me, I'm going to get you. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Well, you got to get out of that mode of thinking and get into righteous thinking and, and understand that love is greater than hate. Tell your neighbor, learn to love some. We got to love, and, and I know it's hard. I know it's hard. That's why it takes practice. It, it's not about how you feel on the inside. Okay, it's obeying God even though it feels hard to do. Note number three, write this down. Because God is righteous, measuring up to the standard of his law, we can trust him. He is honest in his dealings. Somebody may ask, well, how do we know what is right? What is right? Uh, and you have some scholars who uh, say that God determines what is right. Whatever God say is right, is right. And then there are other scholars that say God uh, can uh, make things right. But my brothers and sisters, you need to understand God's righteousness is, is, is based on, a, a, on reality. Listen, he is the creator of the world. Let me just ask you some common sense things. Uh, uh, just You just answer it the way you want to because all of us are free and everybody's got their own ideas. But let me just ask you, is it right to take a bath with an electric lamp in the tub? <laughs> what y'all laughing at? <laughs> I, I just want to know if it's right. Is it right to run across I-10 while the cars are coming at a speed of 70 or more? Is that right? Is it right to turn a fan? No. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Jane. But right deals with reality. Now, just because you imagine something does not make it right. And a lot of us like to create our own right. But you can't create right. Right can't be created. Right is right all the time. Right can never be wrong any other time. 
and wrong could never be right. That makes sense. Y'all got that? All right, so some of us try to make our wrong right, but it still ain't right. I can say all I want that I am a crocodile. I can crawl on the floor. I can even bite some of you as you pass by. I'll never be a crocodile. Yeah. Never. I can have them sew a tail on me, sew my legs together, put some skin on me. I'm, I will still never be, tell your neighbor never. never. I will never be a crocodile. No. So you need to understand that what God says is right has a lot to deal with what is real. Yeah. How does God know what is real? He created it. You can't tell the creator what something is. One more question. If you were standing on the top of this building outside, on the end, on the edge, is it a good idea to take one more step? I know you can walk. I know that's your legs. I know that's your legs. These my legs, Pastor. Don't tell me what to do. That's beside the point. It doesn't matter what you believe. Reality. You must learn to live within reality. Come out of, as my late father would say, come out of fantasy world and come into reality. Some of you have not stopped playing since you've been a child. It's natural for children to pretend. But how many of you have learned that the real world is nothing like it was when you were pretending as a child? My sister and I would play a game we call simply house. That was the name of the game. Want to play house? Yeah, let's play house. She was the wife. I was the husband. We had multiple automobiles. It depended on where, how many sofas my mama had in the house. That was our automobiles. And of course, we had the best automobile. We didn't ride around like Reverend Carl, all raggedy. We had nice cars. Amen. We had BMWs, Mercedeses, and, and all of that. And they never needed gas. Never broke down. We never needed a mechanic. Our car would always stop. And it could go anywhere our minds would imagine. You all have a witness in here. And of course, I had a top paying job. And I was the CEO, of course. And my wife did not have to work. All she had to do was stay home and make pies all day. We didn't eat anything else, Brother James. All we ate was pies. And she never had to go to the grocery store. We always had food in the cupboard. How many of you have learned that that's not reality? You can't continue to play house. You can't go around pretending you're something that you're not. Do I have a witness in here? You can't lift yourself up yourself on a pedestal and pretend that you're all that how many of you understand that God has your life in the palm of his hand how many of you have already learned that you can have a job today how many of you know it can be gone tomorrow how many of you know you can have money in the bank and it can be gone The same day. How many of you know you can feel good today and the doctor can tell you you're dying tomorrow? 
So reality is harsh and we try to stay away from reality and that's one reason why many of us stay away from God because God operates within reality. And you got to grow up and learn to accept what is real. So his righteousness is based on what's real. You're going to leave here one day. We ask many of you, have you planned your funeral? Oh, man, I don't want to talk about that. Oh, man, what, what I got to talk about that for? Because that's what's real. Raise your hand if you know you're going to leave here one day. And tell your neighbor that can be sooner. What's the other part? All right, but you better be ready for sooner. That's real. And we've got to talk about that. We've got to talk about leaving here. We've got to talk about what happens to us when we leave here. We've got to have that conversation. Are you ready to die? If you die today, will you wake up in heaven or hell? We've got to have that conversation. Yeah. Righteousness. God deals in righteousness. Did y'all take that note? We can trust him, right? Thirdly, let's move on. We need to talk about God's justice. God is a just God. God does not show favoritism. Elders, help me. Was good for the... Is good for the... Say it again. Y'all learn this. Come on, young people. Say, what's good for the... Is good for the... And that's how God looks at it. You need to understand that God didn't just die for you. He died for the whole world. He's a just God. He loves everybody the same. Some of you think you're special. Some of you think you're closer than God than others. Some of you think God loves you more than everybody else. That's you being evil. You're just wicked like that. You're just selfish and you want God all for yourself. But God loves the whole world. Jesus died for everybody and he told us to go out there and tell them that I died for them. Give them the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, say whosoever, believe in him should not perish but have so God is a just God, and uh, Adam and Eve began this process of not understanding that. If you look at Genesis 2, 17, you know the story. They ate of the tree, and God warned them because he's a just God. Now he said, listen now, I'm going to warn you, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when." Say when. when. You must not fornicate. You must not commit adultery. Thou shall not kill. Thou shall not steal. Is that law still good for us? Yeah. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will. Will ain't good enough, me. Pull that up for me. Some people didn't get this. Pull that back up for me. You will certainly. Tell your neighbor, you can be certain about that. Hmm. You will certainly die. 
Only those who've never committed a sin, raise your hand. Just those who've never. What kind of church is this? You mean everybody in this thing? And y'all call y'all self Christians. That's why we need to be a Christian. Because we're on this debt list. We're on this journey to die. How many of you know you're on it now? Every day when you wake up, you are a step closer. Do I have a witness in here? You closer to your end. It's foolish for an old man to be a fool. Uh, listen, listen. I, 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 could, I could tolerate a 20-year-old fool. I, I, I take that. But when you're 50 and above and you still a fool, you still think you got it going on. Neither do you have it going on. You don't even have it no more. No, you don't got it no more. You, you, it ain't that. Come on now. Come on now. Let me help you. Uh, uh, senior ladies, y'all know I love y'all, but uh, you know you don't have it like you used to have it. Uh, it don't matter what kind of heels you put on. You know you're going to need some, uh, uh, some Bengay when you get home. Do I have a few witnesses? In? Because we are on that path. You're on it. You're on it. You're on your way. To dying. Certainly. Sin put you on the path. And God is a just God. So we ask the question again. What is right? And what is wrong? Pull up the next slide. The realist. These are these people scholars they maintain that God chooses the right because it is right what he calls good could have not been designated otherwise but the nominalists they say this next slide asserted that it is God's choice that makes an action right but that would make God evil some of us think we can choose a right why is it right? Because I said so. Now, listen to me, parents. I know you have parental power, parental status, but sometimes the children are right that you are wrong in what you're saying. And you threaten the child's very life. So you calling me a lie? So you make the child lie about telling you the truth. The child got to say, no, my, you not lying. But they know you lying. So I used to tell my mom and dad, no, you just telling a story. Mama say, that sound like you calling me a lie. <laughs> God does not choose what is right. He tells us what is right because it is right. Y'all got that? So right is not something arbitrary. Look at that note a minute. So that cruelty and murder would have been good if God had so declared. God follows a standard that is part of the very structure of what? Reality. Which part, which is a part of his own nature. Somebody said, is God real? The Bible says only a fool will say in his heart, 
that God doesn't exist. There's too much evidence that God exists. I know God exists because when I went outside to put the garbage out, at 6 o'clock in the morning, before I got back inside, I needed to take a shower. Do I have a witness in here? Only a God can make a sun that's 93 million miles away that high. God is real. What keeps your heart beating? You ever thought about that? This my life, Rev. Let me tell you something. You might be a little preacher over there at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church, but you need to mind your own business because this my life. Your heart's still doing this. Do, 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 do. And nobody tell me what to do with my life. All God's got to do is just do. Rev, help! Your life, your very existence. Scripture says, in him we live, move, and have our being, our existence. It's because of God. You ever had a nightmare and couldn't wake up? I'm going to raise your hand if you had one of them. Anybody started praying in the middle of that? You ever had one of those nightmares you couldn't move? Come on now, that's one of them scary ones right there. And then in the midst of can't move, you can't breathe. You ever got that? In him, we live, move, and have our existence write this down God's justice means that he administers his law how Fair. not showing favoritism or partiality these are things you need to understand Y'all got that? I know you thought you were special, but you're not. You're not. I'm sorry. No, note number four, write this down. Only. Note five, I'm sorry, I got four about it. Pull it up, Chris. The next one. Oh, y'all corrected it. It's still wrong on mine. Only a person's acts. Listen now. Tell your neighbor, it's what you do. Not his or her station in life or considered in the assignment of consequences or rewards. It doesn't matter if you are movie star, a multi-millionaire. When it comes to God, what a man sold Come on now, get some understanding. That shall he also reap. It doesn't matter that you are the owner of the company or you the head of the house. What a man sows. It's already been released. Your consequence is on the way. Tell your neighbor it's on the way. See, you thought you got away with it. Man, I got away. I did this thing, man, 20 years ago. Nobody never knew, man. You forgot about God. What's done in the dark doesn't matter who you are. See, man, since I did that thing, I joined the church and got on the deacon board, so... I don't think God going to bring that thing on me because of all the good service I'm doing now. 
your consequence is on the way. Learn to say, thank you, Lord, for the consequence. Them are love. Come on now, this is how you know you're his, right? Them are love, I just So you got to learn when you're in the hospital. Not to ask God, why me? But what took you so long, Lord? I knew it was coming. <laughs> Don't play the righteous role. You know you deserve everything God bring your way. Don't be so surprised. That is you. And let me tell you something. You're not the long ranger. That's the right. That's the way y'all say. How many of you know some other people suffering? How many of you know somebody else going through something? We all will go through based on yeah. our acts. What you done? You got to pay for it on this side. Do I have a few witnesses in there? Even though you're a believer, even though you're on your way to heaven, you still will receive. See, we don't want to hear that. No, I, I just want you to forget about it. I forgave you. But the ball is already. Do I have a witness in there? I slept with this young lady last night. Lord, please stop it. It's too late. Conception have already taken place. So it, don't, it doesn't do you no good to curse the girl out now. Don't be calling my son so hard. But I'm pregnant. I don't, it ain't for me. That ain't going to help you. No. That's not going to help you. You might as well accept the consequences. Tell your neighbor you got to accept your consequences. I don't believe that. You don't have to believe it. God deals with in what is real. See, you're in fantasy. Now, I have enough witnesses in here to tell you that what I'm saying is true. How many of you in here right now are experiencing a consequence of breaking God's law? It's real. It's true. Look at 1 Samuel 8 and 3. Talking about the priest's sons. Eli's sons thought that because their daddy was the high priest, we can run the women up in this state. Because we're covered by daddy's station in life. Yeah. Who will dare bring charges against Eli's boy? Yeah. My daddy, the pastor of the church. Yeah. I sing in the choir. I'm the lead singer, baby. can be gay if I want to. Nothing's going to happen to me. Look at this. But his sons did not, say did not, did not. follow Eli's ways. They turned aside after this honest game and accepted bribes and perverted justice. Look at note number five. Or six, I'm sorry. God expects his followers to emulate his righteousness and justice. 
We are, say we are, we are. to adopt as our standard his law and precepts. My brothers and sisters, we are to show no favoritism to folk, to anybody. We are to be righteous and just even if it's our own children. If you're big enough to do the crime, these one of the sermons you don't get many amens. If you did the crime, now see you can't wait. It says, uh, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when he's old, he will not depart. You can't wait till he's in jail or train. Too late now. See, you got to do that kind of teaching from a baby. You're big enough to steal the cookie. Oh, that's so cute. He went in there and stole three cookies, girl, and hid behind the Christmas tree. I videoed it and put it on YouTube. I got a million hits. Spare the rod. Stealing is not allowed even by a baby. And babies know how to steal. How many of y'all got some criminal babies? Come on now. You don't have to teach them how to steal. They know how to steal. All right, it's built in. They look both ways. I love all my grandchildren, but well, some of them still. And this is how I found out because we told them one snack, now that's all you get. So when I went to clean the house, I found bags of snacks all behind the sofa. I'm like, where did these come from? Somebody had more than one snack. Write this down. God expects his followers. Did we do that one? To emulate treatment of people. We are to be fair. Tell your neighbor, be fair. Last, last scripture. But if you show favoritism, come on parents, pay attention to me. You sin. It's your fault. Yeah. Now Ricky got to go to jail, but you made that criminal. You, I don't know why he, you did it. Because when the teacher told you he was cutting up in class, you took his side. You made that criminal. You sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Y'all got that? Jesus paid dearly so that we can share in God's moral purity. He died on a cross. He received nails in his hands, nails in his feet, 
so that you can share in God's holiness. They hung in between two common thieves so that you can share in God's righteousness. He stayed there from the sixth to the ninth hour and he died so that you can share in God's righteousness. He was buried in a borrowed tomb so that you can share in God's justice. He stayed right there all night Friday night, all day Saturday, all Saturday night, but Sunday morning, early in the morning, he got up with all power in his hand so that you can share eternity. How many of you glad he died? How many of you glad he took the penalty of sin away that we can live eternally? But now he expects for you to emulate his life. As a believer, you are not to stay as you were in the past. God expects you to study his word, be taught his word, and to develop as a believer and to become a better person, to become more like him that many more might be saved.